Are you texting him right now? Texting who, Maddie? Donald Trump, obviously. <laughs> no, I'm texting my wife. But uh, I have his cell phone number. I think it's an old cell phone number. I would love to call that right uh, now. Yeah, he wouldn't pick up if I called. But you know, he used to, um, years ago, he used to call me about three times a week. Just check in. Uh, he would send me these envelopes full of newspaper clips and, about himself. Uh, and when I would take them out, you know, he would, he would use his famous Sharpie. Uh, just so I couldn't miss it, he would circle his own name. Uh, in ads or newspaper articles about him that he didn't want me to miss. You say he would just check in with you. Why? I mean, you, you were working for a media organization. I was at the New York what, Times at the time. What was the point of him calling you and talking to you? Well, because I, I think he's yeah. a media addict, yeah. one. I think, you know, he can't exist outside the spotlight. Mm -hmm. um, so part of it is it's just, it's his drug of choice, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I was at the New York Times and Donald Trump grew up in Queens. Mm -hmm. And I think for him, getting attention from the New York Times was like the good housekeeping seal of approval. Mm -hmm. He really thrived on it. I don't think it had anything to do with me. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just I was occupying a seat right. that was important to him at that point in time. Yeah. And he does not focus on a lot of things. He, he is not disciplined. Mm -hmm. as we know, right? but he can focus on the media and getting attention like it's nobody's business. And he got a lot of positive attention out of stuff that you wrote, of course, stuff <laughs> that some of your competitors wrote, but also some of that attention also ended up being pretty negative. Yeah, but you know, I don't think he ultimately, he cares about negative press in the short term, mm -hmm. and in the long term, he just sticks it in a box in the back of his mind and, and moves along. You know, at one point when I was working on the book with him, um, he said, you're just, gonna, you're just gonna do a garbage book. I mean, I know it. I just never should have done this. And I said, well, then why'd you do it to begin with? And he said, well, because I thought it was a challenge. I thought I could convolt, you know, cultivate you. I could win you over to Trump. And then the interesting thing he said was, in the end, it doesn't really matter what you write about me because I basically have my own printing press. I can go on the Today Show tomorrow and say that Tim O'Brien's mental, mm -hmm. uh, or I can call up page six and say you can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. And that's a positive for me. I have that, nobody else in the media does. And you know, that was a very savvy observation he had. Because hmm. that was pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter. Yeah. Right. And Twitter and Facebook empowered him only further. Uh, and he really is that unusual person who can go right over the top of the media mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get to his own audience on his own terms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the reason why he dismisses negative coverage in the long term. In the short term, it always bruises his ego. Beyond his understanding of media, what is one thing that you think you understood about Trump more than your peers heading into the 2016 election because you'd been reporting on him for so long? Um, that basically he was like the crypt keeper and uh, uh, you know he was gonna open this door and all of these monsters were gonna come running up from the basement and that he really didn't care. He could unleash those on the American public and live with it. What did that look like, though? What do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, I think, you know, I think Donald Trump weaponized racism and anti-institutionalism and division in the service of his own candidacy mm -hmm. and the acquisition of power. And he did it to great effect. Mm -hmm. And I think the party has learned that from him. I think the party has sacrificed policy on the altar of the acquisition of power. In fairness, though, he wasn't the first candidate, or a successful candidate, to do that. Why was what he did different and unique versus some of his predecessors? Well, I think that's a really good point. I don't think he's the first even you know, public figure in the US who did it. Father Coughlin did it with radio mm -hmm. in the 1930s. Joe McCarthy did it with TV in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump did it And you're it talking with... about two people there who are also very savvy when it came to the media of their day. And, and we're happy to inflame people's passions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to occupy center stage and get traction with the public at the expense of constructive solutions mm -hmm. to America's problems. And I think that Trump did that with social media. Mm -hmm. and, and I think people who are effective at at propagandizing public attention mm -hmm. and sensationalizing issues have an almost preternatural um, gravity toward the channels that allow them to do that. Is that strategy part of the fabric of the GOP now? Is that something that they can move past in order to get Republicans in office? That's a great question. I think that's the party's dilemma right now. Yeah. I think, um, you know, this is a party that showed up at the 2020 Republican convention without a platform. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to say we don't have a platform we'll just engage in theater. And we've learned that, you know, hot button cultural issues, whether it's wokeism or CRT or ESG, you know, the whole sort of alphabet soup of nonsensical things, <laughs> um, does get them traction with voters yeah. and gets them elected. 
Uh, but I think there's also voters have, have gotten an education through the Trump administration. And I think particularly, I think, um, conservative Democrats, independents, mo moderate Republicans. I think the issue now is that the Republican Party can't put a national coalition together to win the White House mm -hmm. by embracing Trumpism. Mm -hmm. But they're going to have a hard time getting through primary season by weaponizing Trumpism. And it's easy to weaponize Trumpism, particularly among the lower lights of the party. Is there not a terminal velocity to that? I mean, at what point do you just run out of things to scare people with? There, there may be, yeah. but I don't think that ends until, mm -hmm. you know, you hit that terminus. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they haven't hit it yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and I think there's people waiting in the wings who are trying to find better ways of crafting Trumpism right. to acquire power. Ron DeSantis, Josh Hawley. Ted Cruz, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But you make that point here about what works in the primary season with regards to just getting your base, your party to vote for you, doesn't always work in a national election where you need those independent voters and those middle of the road voters. Why is what Trump was able to pull off in 2016, he wasn't able to do in 2020, and in the next presidential election in 2024, is that also gonna be a sticking point? Well, I think in 2016, Trump consolidated in the primary season a divided field. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was another Republican candidate who was able to build enough of um, their own momentum mm -hmm. throughout the rest of the field to mount a serious counteroffensive against Trump's growing momentum. Um, uh, and I think, I think in the 2016 general election, I think the American voters I don't think we're fully educated in who he was yet. They are now. Mm -hmm. They've seen that they saw it play out for four years until 2020. And, and by a narrow margin, it's still, I think, yeah. surprisingly uh, distressing margin, given the fact that Donald Trump took a meat cleaver to democracy. Um, and more people voted for him in 2020. Right. On an absolute basis than they did in 2016. Right, and, the, and yeah. the result came down to swing states again. Mm -hmm. And this is why I wonder whether we can really reject the idea of him winning in 2024. He had success in 2020. I mean, I'm not rejecting it. I think he's got a harder hill to climb. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think he's gonna, I think anyone who dismisses him as a force in the primary season um, just doesn't realize right now that the basically watching Republican Party politics is watching a hostage video, mm -hmm. and that Donald Trump is holding the party hostage uh, because they can't win with him, and to a certain extent, they can't get complete traction without him. Give us a little sense, though, of the magnetism <clears throat> for a man that doesn't really seem to be too concerned about actual policy or at least pitching policy to voters, of what the magnetism is that keeps tens of millions of people still in his mm. camp. Uh, I think he is the average American's idea of what the American dream is. Mm. You know, if, if, if you were to win the lotto, you would end up with bombshell babes on your arms, and you would have this, this apartment in Trump Tower that looks like something Louis XVI would build if he was on an acid trip. And, and you would have huge <laughs> cars, and you would live large, yeah. and why the heck not? And you would say anything you want, mm -hmm. and you'd fly everywhere, and that would be awesome. And he revels in that. Mm -hmm. And it's who he is. He's authentic. He's in his zone. Mm -hmm. and, and the people who love him dig that. But they also find out that it also means that, you know, you, you want to torch the Constitution. Yeah. I mean, and, I dig that from a professional boxer or, you know, an actor or something. But well, but that's who you, he is. He's, okay. a, he's right. a celebrity. Yeah. He's, he, is, he is probably now the most famous celebrity who's ever lived. Yeah. He's the star of the American psychodrama mm -hmm. that is still unfolding. And, mm -hmm. and the lesson of Donald Trump is he says as much about us as he does about himself. Where are we now in that psychodrama? With the Ron DeSantis, <laughs> with the Josh Hawley, with all of these people now vying to become the Republican candidate in the next presidential election. Yeah. And of course, Trump standing in the corner saying, this is still my, my crown. Yeah, you know, like there, there will never be the end of a season with Donald Trump. He mm -hmm. won't let the show get canceled. Mm -hmm. You know, at one point, he and, I, he and I were on his jet. He used to screen movies for me, and he really loved Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> Sunset Boulevard, okay. Yeah. I this. Right. Not and he and I were this, on yeah. there, We were sitting there, and there's this scene in Sunset Boulevard where Norma Desmond yeah. um, is sitting next to William Holden on the couch, and, mm -hmm. her, and, and they're watching one of her movies, and she gets outraged that she's no longer famous. And she stands up in the light of the camera yeah. and says, if they've forgotten who a star is, <laughs> well, I'll teach them. I'll teach, you know, basically said, I'm not forgettable. And anybody who thinks I'm forgettable, I'm going to teach them a lesson. Yeah. And Trump leaned over and he goes, this is such a cool scene. 
<laughs> and and that's basically he is the guy telling America yeah. that the Trump show has multiple seasons. Okay. And don't you think you're canceling it because I'll be back. But what if he's well, in we prison? Should, we should, yeah, we should point out that at the end of that movie, uh, Norma Desmond <laughs> goes to prison and William Holden is dead in a pool uh, in the backyard. But, but okay, I put your analogy. You're so negative, man. I get it. Uh, You're you so know, pessimistic. Just, just pointing it out. Yeah, okay. yeah. We are a fact-driven show here. <laughs> well, I have, I have two. We could go in a lot of yeah. directions from here. Yeah. Um, I, I want to start on lessons for other candidates. Ron DeSantis is a big rival of Trump's that's coming up right now. Do you think that he is the future kind of candidate vessel for Trumpism? Well, I think I think there's a lot of candidates who want to be the future vessel of Trumpism. It, it's easy to discount Donald Trump because he's ignorant and undisciplined, but he has authentic charisma, and 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 he has an authentic hold on the American a certain sector of the American imagination. Uh, Ron DeSantis is going to be challenged on I think a national campaign trail to convince voters that he's not an oddball. Mm -hmm. He's a very eccentric man. He can't make eye contact. He, he doesn't, doesn't like warming hands. up a room. He doesn't like to shake hands. Yeah. Um, and I think politicians who can't forge authentic emotional connections with their voters are doomed, no matter how smart they are or how good a policy platform they have. So then, though, on the flip side, <clears throat> what is the lesson for Democrats? What is a Trump tactic that they need to take on to stay in the White House? Well, I mean, I think every party has to have great candidates. And there's, you know, Joe Biden has a lot of flaws. Uh, you know, he is not articulate. Uh, he 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 is, has a low favorability rating. Um, he's had pretty, I think, almost perfect timing and sensibility around policy, and and I think he showed the Republicans that at the midterms. But you know he's going to be a much older man in in, in 24. Um, I don't think that Kamala Harris is a viable successor, and I don't think the the Democrats have cultivated younger, newer candidates mm. or another field to step in. And I think, you know, he's a, he's a president right now, Biden, who's just come strong out of a midterm. That's going to be hard for the party to say step aside. Is age going to be a big factor in this election? I mean, you have Biden, basically 80, and let's say Trump, for some reason, gets the nomination. He's basically 80 as well. Does yeah. that become an issue? You mean like if if basically the White House is a retirement home? Is that an issue for America? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's totally to an issue <laughs> because the Congress yeah. is populated by geezers. Yes. And if you have the White House populated by geezers, yeah. uh, then basically you're not going to have, uh, I think, a policy platform or a connection with voters that is anything but geezerish. Okay, one sentence answer. Who takes the White House in 2024 if oh, you gosh. have to bet now? Joe Biden. Really? I don't think it'll be Donald Trump, but I look, I didn't think he'd win in 2016, so yeah. don't bet money on me. Man. Well, can I push back on that, though? I mean, go through some of the other potential Republican candidates here, uh, whether you're talking about a Mike Pompeo, a Nikki Haley, a Mike Pence, if you will. DeSantis. DeSantis, yeah. of course, as well. You don't think any of them have a viable No, I, th I think I, I, I have a lingering thought that Ron DeSantis could melt on the public stage, mm -hmm. but I think he's a very strong candidate. Mm -hmm. I think Nikki Haley could be a strong candidate. Mm -hmm. I do not think... Mike Pompeo or Mike Pence mm -hmm. are strong candidates. They're just junior jammers. They're not ready for this. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, but I don't see the Dems as having um, somebody waiting in the wings if Biden yeah. steps down, mm -hmm. who can sprint into there. Yeah. You know, possibly, you know, Gavin Newsom. Gavin Newsom. Yeah. 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 Possibly, people are gonna like know. him. I mean, people in California don't even like him. Uh, you know, I think candidates sell themselves at a national level during a presidential election mm -hmm. that gives them a little bit of escape velocity from their past. Gotcha. A little bit. Yeah. But mm -hmm. again, I could be totally wrong.